Welcome back to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian entrepreneurs, influencers, and thought leaders on how you can build not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. I'm excited to have a great friend of mine in the studio with me, which this place is absolutely phenomenal. And this is someone that I've really looked, looked up to for a long time. He had created a podcast a long time ago. I believe it was called Disconnected Dad. And that's where I originally started hearing his content. And it was just about putting down the phone. Like, what, how do we reconnect with our kids? How do we raise up kids in the ways of the Lord where they don't depart from it, not raise them up in the ways of the law and judgment and things that literally every kid departs from? There has to be a difference. If, if scripture says that they don't depart from it when you raise them up correctly, then when all these kids are departing from it and running away from it, then that obviously has to contradict the very thing that we just talked about. And I, I, I followed this guy. He had reached hundreds of thousands of kids. He had been the children's pastor at a place that I went to school, which was Bethel Church in Reading. I've seen him consistently speak not only to our communities. I brought him into our masterminds where people invest $25,000 plus a year, all the way to our live events, other free things that we've done, and every single time it rocks people and leaves them in tears. So you're gonna to wanna to stay to the very end of this episode. If you're someone that plans on having kids, has kids, or even if the kids are out of the house and you wanna feel really, really bad about the way you raise I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but please welcome my friend, Seth Dahl. Hello, so good to be here again. Yeah, I, so bet, I bet it's annoying when people hear your content when their kids are already like out of the house. Yeah, At that point, like, what do you do? Like, yeah. what, what do you advise for that? Like, is there anything that you have for that? Like, if someone's like, my kids are 18, like, I'm gonna turn this off because I don't even wanna hear what I did wrong. I mean, the foundation of everything I work on with families is connection. And so, you know, a lot of times, yeah, kids have pushed back or walked away from what those parents would say was God, but then they hear some new stuff, they're like, oh, man, I raised my kids legalistic or in religion. And yep. so my kid walked off. I I wish I had known this stuff when I was younger, when they were younger, but at the core of it all is connection, relationship, and repairing that. You know, even if you got little tiny kids, you can damage the connection and you gotta repair it. So I think it's yeah. never too late. You know, it is never too late to go, hey, you're 18, you're out of the house. I messed up. I wanna build connection. I wanna reconnect. I wanna I want to have our relationship get strong again. And from there is where all the fruit happens. You know, in, I like that you're doing God's business now. It's like, oh, we yeah. can talk about God freely. Yeah. No, no, no worries. You know, in the new covenant, the behaviors that God wants are fruit, right? Like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's all fruit, which means something grows that. It's not something you manufacture. It's something that can automatically come. And so when a parent's like, hey, my kids are old and grown and I messed up and I wish I would have known this. Like, oh, you can, you can actually go take care of those roots wow. and new things will start to grow. A new relationship will blossom and bloom. And yeah, it's just not too late. Yeah, I mean, you, you even live on acres here in Austin. You mm -hmm. did before in Southern California. Yeah. Is that where you were born? in before? Northern California, yeah. And, and so no matter what, you had acreage. And really, at the end of the day, you could look at land and go, man, that stinks. Weeds have only grown here. Right. Like, what am I going to do? But yeah. you just, well, you, you can go pull them. Yeah, you go pull them. You yeah. till the land. You, yeah. And what's so interesting as well is, is maybe you can hit on this with that, is that even when I read like a, a seed falls on rocky soil and it grows and fast, but then it, it yeah. doesn't, it's it can't take out. roots. Yeah. It, it, thistles, uh, sun, etc. cetera. Uh, what I got from that and that I, what I've used from it is that when you look at farming, and you would know this better than me, right? Your hands are probably like, you probably did something this morning, <laughs> yeah, is that they say morning, that but... the farmer takes more time clearing the soil than he does planting the seeds. Yeah. And I thought that was so interesting. When it comes to that new environment like that, like what's some of the practical things that you've seen work for families that maybe want to start clearing out some of the soil and, and planting. Because yeah. imagine you just start planting new seeds. I, yeah. I look at that like, hey, son, we've, hey, daughter, we messed up your whole life. Uh, why don't you come to church with us? We've really changed our life, right? It's like mm -hmm. new seed, no clearing, no no connection, you no, gotta, yeah. you know what I mean? You got to demonstrate that first. You've got to give them, if you've given them a lifetime of experiences telling them something else, it's going to take some experiences to contradict that. So, Wow. We can't just go in and say, 
hey, I'm changed. Yeah. No, you want your actions to, ch to show that. You want the kids to come back and go, something's different. It's been different for a little while. What's going on? You know, I, I realize I messed up. I've been changing my life. I've been working on stuff. You want the kid to go, I see fruit in you. Yeah. I see change in you. You want them to see that versus go, all good now. Sorry. Come on. Come on back. Like, oh, you got to demonstrate it. Like, th that's, that's a really important thing. You know, I, I, love, um, I love farms, gardens, because I think we've lost touch with a lot of that. And it's yeah. so key to all of life. But I also love, like, animals. We've, we've got a bunch of animals. But, like, dog training, it's really important that if, if people have had bad experiences with dogs, right? Like, a dog bit them. So now they're super afraid. They, they don't want to go near dogs. They're, they freak out, paranoid. Any, anytime they're near dogs, like, oh, I can't just tell you that's a safe dog. That dog's fine. That dog's going to be calm with you. No, they're freaking out. Why? Because they're experienced. So what needs to happen is I can't just tell them that. I need to introduce them to experiences that show them there are safe dogs. There are dogs that aren't going to just bite you for no reason. And the experience have to contradict the experience. You can't just say it. It's the same with families like, hey, if my kid's been bit by mom and dad for a long time, I probably need to stop biting and let them see like, oh, I'm safe. Oh, mm. I'm loving. Oh, I'm kind. And then they can go, hey, what's, uh, what's happening there? There's so much I want to get into with even just controlling kids. I, I just talked to a lady the other day that grew up in a very religious household. And it got to the point where all the parents in this community had to commit to raising their kids the same way. Only the kids that were inside of this course or curriculum could hang out with each other. Yeah. And anyone who was wow. a part of that had to commit that they were all raising the kids the exact same way. And it was like fear. It was a lot of these things of what I would probably Sounds say like control. Cult. Yeah, and, and even they would <laughs> say that, that now. But I even catch myself, right? It's like, I want my son to prosper so bad that I wish that I could literally control it rather yeah. than rather than kind of tend it, plant it. Mm -hmm. These things are fruits, like you said. I think that that was really cool. I anchor that there also for people to know, hey, we're going to get into that. Yeah. I, one thing I've never asked you before is I never really asked you how you grew up. Because like our examples a lot of times as a kid will either do the same thing as our parents or the exact opposite. Yeah. And both of them usually aren't that great. Yeah. Like they're, yeah. my no. parents didn't buy me anything, so I'm going to spoil my kid. Yeah. Uh, my parents. My parents spanked me all the time, so I'm never gonna. Never spank. gonna. I'm, I'm never, never gonna, gonna discipline. Discipline at all. Yeah. So what was what was it like for you growing up in your family dynamic? I don't know how I never heard this before. Yeah, my my parents got divorced. I think I was not even one. So I'm a baby, and mm -hmm. my dad is gone. He moves to another state, so it's just me and my mom for nine years till she gets remarried. But in those nine years, um, my mom worked at. AT&T back when it was just there was no such thing as cell phones so it's yeah. like she worked at AT&T and then she got a job at my school so she put me in a Christian school in kindergarten well before that we lived in Sacramento and then we moved back to Iowa puts me in a Christian school gets a job there so it's like a lot of times she would drive us there and I'd hang out with my mom while she worked and then I'd go to school and then come back and hang out with mom and so she was she was making it happen as a single mom, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, I grew up only child for nine years. Then my sister, that she got remarried, my sister came along. So I have a sister and I can't, I got a stepbrother then as well, but he never lived with us. So I was basically like an only child for a and long time. And then where time, was dad? He was in, he lived in Washington, D.C. for a long time. Then he lived in uh, Denver. Then he So lived this wasn't in, like a, hey, you'll get this weekend, I'll get next weekend type just deal. Just me and my mom all the time. Like, wow. and I... Yeah, the way I describe it, like we were talking about just divorce and, you know, your son's coming to the age where that's when your parents got divorced. I'm like, man, I, I, I'm almost every day. Like my little six-year-old right now, he's the youngest one. He's just punching all the time. Like we just fight. He just wants to fight. So we're fighting, punching. He's block, He's trying to learn how to block because yeah. I just knock him left and right. It's great. But he loves the fight. But every time we do it, I'm going, I never had this. At six, wow. I never had this. And so I tuck my kids in bed and I'm going, I never had this. Like, I never had dad tell me stories at night. I go wow. to a soccer game and I'm like, I never had this. Yeah. I, so 
my story growing up was I, I just didn't have dad around. Yeah. I spent years crying for dad to come home, praying for dad to come home. My dad would come visit a couple times a year and leave, and I'd just cry because I wanted him to stay. And then yeah. my mom gets remarried, and I'm like, I don't want a stepdad. I want my dad. So there was friction there. My whole, from nine till I moved out, was just lots of friction. So, yeah, that's that's kind of it in a short yeah. form. But, I, yeah, so it, for me it's kind of like I want... I want to give my kids what I never had without overreacting. You know, a lot of times what you mentioned, I would call it, the, yeah, it's just overreacting. So you find out like, wow, I spent my whole childhood in a ditch. So I yank the wheel and I end up in a different ditch, right? So, yeah. so I, some of the areas I've struggled, not struggled with, but need to pay attention to was like, oh, I want to be home with my kids and so sometimes it was like I'd feel guilty or I'd feel horrible if I'm like, oh, I'm traveling to go speak somewhere and do something. I'm not home with my kids. I'm not. I missed a soccer game or I missed like, wait, hold on. Just because I never had a dad at home doesn't mean I can't ever leave or not be home. Like, no, I actually need to get on the road here and go, I'm home a lot. And when I'm home, I'm as present as I can be. If I'm not present, my wife will call me on it, and so I get present again. But it's like, oh, I can leave and and work and do ministry and travel and then come home, mm -hmm. and it's fine. I don't have to overreact and go, I never had a dad, so I'm only going to be home all the time. And So that's that's my story and some of what I've kind of like yeah. realized, like, oh, yeah, my tendency would be to overreact and then do the exact opposite of what I had. One quote that someone had said was that, that I thought was interesting. And I think that it kind of fits on this because your kids are seeing you do something that's your calling, your mm -hmm. mission, this show. Yeah. Right? You coming on, you can share things, it can change people's lives. Yeah. They say a lot of people want to play with their kids, which is great, but you're not going to grow up and go play in the sand. They're going to grow up and have to go after their purpose. And yeah. so like showing them what that looks like, because yes. if you only play with your kids, yeah. then they only see dad playing in the sandbox yeah. and i was like oh wow so like when i'm on the podcast like oh like dad's a superhero remember like i'm going to the office because i'm a superhero i got to go do some big things yeah and it kind of shifted my perspective on that obviously there's the time where your kids can be more involved with the travel or yeah. going somewhere and all of that that's yeah. three years old no <laughs> not it's not you guys just went to malaysia but, I was like oh lord yeah. i was praying for you guys like that's a long flight yeah with Kingston, 35 hours like, from yeah. left to land yeah yeah no i have i have a lot of thoughts on that like i i my strength is put the phone down be present with your kids that's a strength i have strengths yeah. overemphasized can become weaknesses right so just within the last few months i really felt like the lord was like seth you work really hard not to be on your phone when you're with the kids whether you're in the car whether you're whatever and i'm you know i'm trying to make phone calls to texas workforce and employees and taxes and all this stuff and i realized like the lord showed me like seth you're not you're training your kids to be very present playing in the sandbox or whatever it is yeah but they're not seeing you interact on the phone or interact with people like this like oh so i've been working lately to go like let me jump on that call in front of them hey guys i need to jump on a call i need you to be really quiet when we're driving and i'm over here discussing taxes and employees with the government guy and trying to figure that out you know i jump on the call with the with the insurance company because someone hit my truck and the insurance company is trying to pay but the rental car place isn't trying to let them work and so i'm yeah. i'm going oh I need to teach my kids negotiation skills. How do I do that? Negotiate in front of them, get on the phone in front of them. So I'm going, oh, my tendency would be put the phone away completely, not yep. grab it and let them see that in action and and watch me do that kind of thing. I think that's, yeah, I'm going, oh, I could go in this ditch of never touching the phone with my kids, but I need to stay back on the road again yeah. as well. And like my daughter, I, it was really cool. Like I really protect travel and stuff like I don't if I go clear across the planet I'm home on day nine because by day 10 I'm kind of like holding a microphone preaching going 
I just want to be home. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to mm -hmm. pray for you. I don't want like the, that's what I'm fighting inside. So day nine, I'm home. But I had a church call me in Australia and say, hey, you want to stay two weekends? I said, I'd love to. But the only way I can do that is if I have one of my kids with me. And they're like, well, we'll fly your one of your kids out. So my daughter and I this month, next month are going to Australia. We're going to have two weekends. We're going to go to Sydney. We're going to go to Melbourne. Yeah. We're going to see all this stuff. And so I'm going, now that my kids are older, I'm like, oh, you get to travel with me. Oh, you get to run my book table. Oh, you're going to bring your own products and run your own little business in Australia and sell your stuff, sell my stuff, help me with ministry, watch me interact in all this. And you're now that she's 12, she can go do that stuff. But I'm going, yeah, I'm not just leaving without them where they never get to see it. I'm not just talking on the phone when they're not there. I'm trying to include all of that in mm -hmm. so they see what that's like and they're watching me do all this stuff. Yeah, and you guys have done a great job. I remember even at our events, your kids were running the book table, I think even yeah. 2021. Yeah. So they were even younger. Yeah, when my daughter was 10. And, she was and, and go through uh, all your kids and ages just so people know as well. Our daughter's 12. She is about to turn 13. Our first son yeah. is 10, yeah, and then our little guy's six. Cool. So girl, boy, boy. Cool. And, and for you, you said you left the home. You, you grew up in a Christian home mm -hmm. in, in is, is kind of what you had said. Yeah. Yet that, that wasn't something you, you didn't just go into like youth ministry. I mean, you were, in no. te you were in children's ministry even before you even had kids, first yeah. off. So you were in, interacting with kids. So walk me through that process of leaving the home to yeah. your Jesus moment. Because it sounds, it's so interesting. Like for me, I didn't grow up in church. Yeah. So I didn't have this, I'm in the flow of it, but I need to make my own decision. Yeah. I was just like, I don't know anything about this. Yeah. And so I just had this this one time that I made my own decision. Yeah. My friend here, even he'd been in church five times. My uh, Another person I talked to, they were, I told you they grew up in a Christian household, but it was so strict. Yeah. It was like, it, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't fruit, it was control, it was yeah. like manufactured. Yeah. For you, what was what happened when you left the house and you got out of that environment that you were maybe constrained in? Yeah, well, before I left the house, I had already walked away from, I thought walking away from God, I was walking away from religion and all that. So 16, I started doing drugs, uh, started smoking weed, get caught first time, expelled from school, my dad's like, you can either go to homeschool and get a job and get straight A's and figure this out, or you're going to military school. I'm like, well, I'm not going to military school, that's for sure. Yeah. I'll figure this out at homeschool and get a job. Well, then, so 21, I didn't actually move out till I was 21, but by then it was much worse. I was addicted to, well, I quickly, as soon as I moved out, I quickly became addicted to coke, which turned into meth, which turned into messing around with acid, mushrooms, and then ecstasy showed up, and I was basically like, screw everything. I just want to eat and snort ecstasy all day, every day. And so I quickly became a drug addict and had to sell drugs just to pay for my habit. You know, I broke the rule, don't get high on your own supply. It's like, well, I had to have somebody else's supply just so I could get high. Yeah. Like, I had to sell it to, to do it. And so... Yeah, I, w I ran as fast and as far away from God as I possibly could, thinking I was getting away from Him when really I just was trying to get away. I was actually looking for Him, trying to get away from religion. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, fast forward a couple years of just hard drugs all day, every day, and I end up with a gun in my mouth, going to pull the trigger, and I'm like... I, w I, I literally say to myself, I wish I would have listened to my pastors and my teachers and my parents. I wish I could start my life over. And then out of my mouth, said, I said, I wish I could just be born again. And I feel someone walk in the room. Like, I can't see anybody, but I know he's there. And I hear out loud, basically out loud. I can't tell if it was out loud. It felt out loud in my head. It was so clear, so loud. I hear, you must be born again. And of course, I'm the Christian kid who knows, I know who's talking. I know what verse that is. I know where it's at in the Bible. I know all that. And I said, Jesus, if you're real and you can make me born again, you got to make me born again or I'm pulling the trigger. And I started weeping and re confessing everything. And I fall asleep 
I don't know how long it took. I fell asleep just weeping, and I wake up the next day totally delivered from drugs. And somewhere in that night, this is how I got in children's ministry, somewhere in that night I said, Jesus, if you get me out of this, I will help kids not go down the path I went down, which was learning all about God, knowing the Bible, not knowing the author, learning about God, but not knowing God. And so I was, so within, it was only, it was like two days, and I'm in youth ministry. Like I, I, I wake up from this, I wake up the next day totally free. I'm like, I don't, I, I, I walked outside, I'm like, wow, the sky is really blue. I thought, I was just so drugged up for so long, like living inside, snorting ecstasy and mixing ecstasy and coke and acid all at the same time, just off the rails, stupid. And, and I'm, I'm outside like, wow, I haven't seen this. Like everything was new. Like I wasn't just new. Everything was new to me. And two days later, I see a kid, a guy, a grown man now, but he was a kid. We were in junior high together. We always got in trouble, so our parents wouldn't let us really hang out. I'm like, I wave at him at a stoplight. We pull over. I was like, Josh, I'm a Christian again. He's like, Seth, I'm a youth pastor. Come to my youth club. So the end of the week, Friday, I go to his youth club, and he's got all these skater, goth, punk rock kids. They do a skate park, and then they preach the gospel and have all these bands come in and and do shows and then preach the gospel and he sticks a mic in my hand I share my testimony and so I'm like before I can even figure out what's going on I'm like ministering to young people and I told God if you get me out of this I'll help kids and so that's where my whole ministry started working with kids and parents and everything was this one phrase one statement comes out of my mouth I'll help them and when you had that moment like the gun gun in the mouth you get to this, like, you know, there's a lot of things that happen to get you there, a lot of emotions. A cry for help, you know, is, like, also there. Yeah. And was it effortless, do you feel like, that whole night? You know, some people would be like, oh, I really want to experience God, and they put all this, like, maybe effort in, and, yeah. and they, they, like, search and dig and do all these things. When that happened, did you feel like you were maybe along for the ride or, or you know... Yeah. engaging with it because you obviously could have re- tried to maybe run away from it and yeah. be like no 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 and run out of that room yeah how did you engage with that moment because a lot of people maybe even right now will will look at the look at us and say okay well let me try this yeah you know maybe you're trying it right now like okay god like if you're going to speak to me speak to me now yeah how are you present engaged and and just tell me how that moment was yeah. maybe other moments are different but that specific moment did you have to try did you have to fight for it? Did you have to stay focused on it? No. I mean, I felt like I got thrown in side of a fire hose and there was no getting out. Like wow. there was no effort, no trying. Jesus said in John, somewhere in John, I don't know off the top of my head, he said, you did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you to bear much fruit. And I, I felt like for me in that moment, that verse became the experience. Oh, you, you saw me. You were watching me. I was trying to run away from you. You never took your eyes off me. You see this happening. You, you hear my heart and you come in the room and you speak to me. And I, the way I would describe it is like the sin the poor decisions, the emotions, all of the stuff that had been swirling around and got me to the place where I was forced its way out of me. I couldn't stop it. You know, G- Paul said, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Like, like goodness grabbed me and said, come on, I'm taking you wow. to repentance. And that's what I felt like happened. It was like, I, I literally confessed everything. It was like thoughts actions that I hadn't thought about were forcing their way out from inside me and just coming out of my mouth like almost like projectile vomiting sin out of my life was what it was happening you know like you can't stop it when it's like I'm gonna throw up like you're not you're not holding that back yeah. that's what it felt like to me like I could not stop this thing if I tried now if I tried I, potentially he would have allowed me to but at the same time in this moment I was like I was I was caught in a current. I wasn't escaping, it felt like. And yeah. so, I, but potentially that's, my heart was ready for that. My mind was ready for that. My, you know, I'm, I'm pulling the trigger. And he's like, 
I don't want you to pull the trigger. I got, I got something else for you. And, and yeah, so for me, there was no effort. The effort was, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to end this. And he's like, you don't have to. What was the immediate difference that you felt the next day when you didn't have the same desires? So maybe before yeah. you would have done drugs, woke up the next day, had a certain feeling. Obviously there's, there's always feelings of when you do something, even to this day, right? You, you stay up too late watching a TV show and you're yeah. like, ah, oh, like I shouldn't have done that. Like yeah. it's kind of annoying. Yeah. You're like I shouldn't have shame or, or be upset about it. I need yeah. to get over it so I can pursue my life. But even to this day, I'll do things where I'm like, why did I go watch that YouTube video that's three hours from Joe Rogan last night? Like, yeah. Why did I do that? Yeah. And, and so the drugs, the decisions probably felt that way. Maybe even the, just the, there's the physical addiction and there's the mental addiction. Yeah. They, there's, they've talked about people that have physical withdrawals from, right. from drugs where they're mentally, they're like, I'm done. Yeah. And then their body's like going to die. You, and yeah. Jordan Peterson even went through this. He yeah. literally had to get, I think, put sedated where he was like put on anesthesia. So that he could handle the withdrawals. In like Russia. Yeah. Because it like wasn't allowed. Cause, and he's a pretty mentally strong dude. Yeah, super mentally strong. Now these are different drugs and all these things. So people that are doctors or whatever. But for you, what was that experience like? Where you just woke up the next day, and then two days later, you're like sharing a testimony in front of kids. Were you feeling completely different, completely no no desires, no nothing like that? It was nothing. Damn. I never had a withdrawal. I never had. Never. Like it was. It was gone. That's I, cool. I, you know, the only way I could describe it was like I was, I was, totally born again like fully yeah. body soul mind heart spirit whatever all of it was completely free and i think like i had no shame i had no guilt i think my awareness of his forgiveness had swallowed up all the shame all the guilt all of that was gone like every like i didn't have any regrets i was like wow you're i just had this awareness like you're going to turn this for good yeah. you're going to use this you're going to so I think I was overwhelmed by a different reality, so much so that the shame couldn't stay, the guilt couldn't stay. You know, those emotions are healthy. Like, it's, it's healthy to have emotions and go, yeah. you know what, I feel kind of crappy because I stayed up three hours watching Joe Rogan until two in the morning or whatever it is. Like, those yeah. are healthy emotions. Yeah. When a spirit attaches to them and now you have a spirit of shame that won't allow you to get come out of it or won't allow you to be free from that. And you live, you know, it's like, dude, you don't want to live 10 years down the road and go, oh, that one day, Joe Rogan, three hours all night. I can't believe it. I've been yeah. fighting against this my whole life. Oh, something else is going on here. That's a different thing than just the healthy emotion of feeling shame. But I felt like mine was all wrapped up spiritually and it was, boom, it was gone. The way I describe like Jesus stepped into my body into my life and everything else stepped out and so i didn't have any withdrawals i didn't have to go anywhere i didn't need help i woke up the next day like i need a bible like i haven't read a bible i went to my mom's house took a bible took some old cds that she had of worship music and i sit in my house for like eight hours because like i don't have a job i don't have anything so i just read my bible and and i wrote all my friends names on and started praying for them and like, I mean, I could tell you story after story. I, the one area I struggled with afterwards was porn. Mm. Like, I was delivered from drugs. I still, I was fine for a while. Porn was where, and cigarettes would try to creep in every once in a while, and like, go buy a pack of cigarettes, and I'd smoke one, get rid of it, smoke another. I'd be like, this is so dumb. What am I doing? And then I'd crush them and throw them away. Like, uh, so, but porn, porn is the one that I felt like God... Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Like, I wrestled with it mm. a little bit longer, like four years. I really wrestled with it. But the drugs, not even yeah. a hint. You, you had even touched on that you got swallowed up by the forgiveness side. Some guy had said something that I thought was interesting. It may be like elementary, but it, it kind of spoke to me. He said how the Bible talks about that he... he separates the sin like as far as the east, east is from the west. west and he said if it were to have been north to south if you go far enough north you end up going south again yeah so like it would not be that far because yeah. north from south is like you know even elon musk's little thing he talks about he says what's the place on the earth that if you were to go south one mile 
uh, and west a mile, and then north a mile, you end up in the same place. And it's yeah. like from the North Pole, because you go down and yeah. come back up. But if the east is from the west, if you go east, you never stop going east. Right. If you go west, and I just thought, wow, wow like what a thought, you know? Yeah. They could have really mucked that up, yeah. you know? And uh-huh. we cast your sin as far as the north, north is from, from the south, and we'd yeah. be like, oh, that's still pretty pretty decently far, yeah. but it's still easy to get back to. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, you go, you go from this place to e- children's ministry, kind of walk people through how long ago that was and, and some of the things that you've done since then. Mm-hmm. I have some things I would love to jump into. Uh, and yeah, so kids. my mom calls me one day because I was going to Josh's church, my friend who was like, come to my youth club. So I go to his church, but she calls me and says, hey, this pastor is coming from New York. You might want to come here. He's great. So I go... This guy is, rips me apart, like just preaching, just, oh. I mean, I still remember his sermon to this day. This is 2001. I'll, I, I, I remember what he talked about. And I went up to him after and said, I want to come do your internship in New York City. He's like, all right, go online, fill it out. I fill it out. Now, what's interesting at this time was I had actually been arrested because what I didn't know was the SWAT team was watching me for drugs when I got saved and delivered. And so a couple months after I'm totally free, I get arrested and taken to jail. And my mom puts her house up and gets me out. And I have to go through, I had a felony. But what's crazy is like, I had a felony that God removed as if it never happened. Like you can't find it anywhere. The FBI, I've had all my background checks for working with kids and all fingerprints and everything. They can't find it. I'm on probation. I'm not supposed to leave the state. They let me leave the state. I go to New York. I'm supposed to be on probation two years. I come back. They're like, you are a different person. We're taking you off probation. We're wiping away your felony. It's all gone. And But I, it started with that guy preaches and wrecks me. And I sign up and I, I end up moving to New York City. And I had no idea what I'm getting into. So I move in September 7th, 2002. I move there. So now I'm, you know, I'm 21 years later as the time we're filming this it's 21 years ago and or heading towards 21 years i moved to new york city probation lets me go i get there and I, and they're like we're going to put you in a team we have 17 teams that would go out into brooklyn bronx queens harlem all over you're going to be on a team you're going to go out there you're going to visit kids in the projects you're probably going to be the only white person there and then you're going to visit them in their houses, and then you're going to do Sunday school five days a week. We're doing Sunday school. And so I didn't know this, but they reached 20,000 kids a week. We would have, we'd go up behind us uh, by a school, and we'd have 400 kids show up right there. So I'm preaching 400 kids at least once a day, sometimes twice, sometimes three times a day. We're going to different projects, preaching the gospel, ministering to kids. And so I did that four years. Like I went as an intern, then went on staff, lived in New York City, right in the ghetto, in Brooklyn, <laughs> ministering in Bronx and Harlem, and oh, it was wild. And so that was my kind of like, now I'm full on in children's ministry and have a lot of experience in children's ministry. Like this is all we do all day. And then that's when I found out about Bethel. Like I was hungry for God's power. We led a lot of kids to the Lord. But I was hungry for the power of God because I'm going, I got saved by the power of God. Like, I believe God can deliver drug addicts. I believe God can heal bodies. Like, but no one's talking about this. So I got really hungry. Like, I want to see miracles. I want to see people on drugs in the middle of the ghetto in New York get totally delivered. I want to see that. So I'm like, sneak around going for it. And then I find Bethel and I'm like, I got to go to that school. So I left everything, gave everything away. I had two suitcases, moved to Northern California, bought me a bike and would ride my bike to school. And Oh, so you went to the school as mm-hmm. well? I did. What years was this then? This, 2006. Was, this was the beginning. Yeah, 2006. Was this like Chad, was Chad Deadman there at that he time? He had a just later? graduated, so he was around. He was hanging out. Oh, cool. Um, Joaquin was my revival group pastor, so he had just graduated. <laughs> Well, All those guys had just graduated. Like they, Bethel wasn't big yet. Like they yeah. thought we were the big class and we're like 300 people. Mm-hmm. But it was nothing compared to what it is now. So yeah, that's kind of the journey. I get to Bethel and it's, I tried to get away from children's ministry completely. I'm like, I'm done. I don't want to do this. And God like wouldn't let me off the hook. Like he just 
was showing me, he was showing me so many things about kids that I'm like, I would be a fool to not go back into kids ministry because of what I'm seeing, what God's showing me. Like I feel called to this by God. And so fast forward, all of a sudden I'm doing sidewalk Sunday school like I did in New York, but now we're doing it in the trailer parks of Reading with like 30 kids. Like there's no 400 kids anywhere near because it's a small town compared to New York City. So like, all right, we got 20, 30 kids in the trailer park rather than 400 in the, in the projects. And so I started there, then became children's pastor, then children's director, and then started realizing like, oh, if we don't help parents, we're, I'm not helping kids as best I possibly can unless we get in the home. And so that's kind of a long, yeah, long, because it, so it's because when you're talking about it, like there's people out there that help people get in a relationship. There's people out there that help people be single. Yeah. Right. Oh, enjoy your singleness. Yeah. Great. Okay. Here's how you get in a relationship. Okay. Here's what you should do before you get married. Okay. Here's what you should do to get married. Okay. You've been married for 20 years and your kids are getting out of the house. How do you reconnect? Yeah. How do you connect as, as that unit inside of your relationship? But there's like a specialty and, and I'm sure you guys have some of that, right? But but where you guys have really focused in is inside of the place as, as a mother and a father together in a home, how do you raise up kids? And I had even touched on raising them up in the ways of the Lord so they will never depart from it. Yeah. And even for me, like my son's three, how can I do that well? You know, it's like there's times where I'm like, okay, he's not even listening to what I'm saying. Yeah. There's times where I mess up all of your strategies. I'm like, the only way this kid's responding is if I'm like, all right, bud, like it's you owe me one spanking. We're yeah. going to do a spanking now because yeah. it's like, if not, he's going to just run off the rails, you know? Yeah. And it's like every kid's so different. Yeah. What? Let's let's kind of crack that open because I'm like, you, you had told a story at my event that I thought was so good uh, when it came to our pursuit of of what we want out of life. And you had talked about um, a really cool biblical story. Maybe crack it open with that. And then I would love, oh man, I have so many so yeah. many juicy ones for I mean, you. I think that question alone, how do we do this, is weeks and weeks. Like we could, we could talk about this forever, you yeah. know? Or, you know, in some sense, you almost need consistent work because it's a relationship, right? So these are people we're dealing with. These are humans. These are, yeah, they have different personalities. One kid is going to be totally different than the next one and the next one. Yeah. And now you're like over, outnumbered and you're going, wow, now I need to regroup again, right? So to me, it's like having people in your life that can help you make adjustments as you, as you go and, along. And people talk about that nature nurture real quick. Like mm -hmm. there, there's the nature side that people talk about, which is the, how the kids can act. You've seen even there's been studies where they take twins they did this terrible right. one where they like separated triplets oh, or man. something yes no which is good. just ter yeah terrible but they ended up like dressing the same having a lot of the same habits a lot of the same desires yeah and, and maybe people see this with kids where they have a di like i have a saint my brother has the same mom different dad and my sister has the same dad different mom yeah so there's just like different D lineages yeah, yeah. So there's that side of it as well. For some of the people out there that are like, I'm trying to do my best and my kid is just acting this way. What's the balance of that? Hey, some kids are just going to act this way because that's just part yeah. of their DNA. And some kids are, are going to act this way because of their environment. How much does the environment affect it? I think they both do a lot. I think part of, like a way I would say this is we want to nurture their nature and we want to create an environment where no matter what their nature is they can thrive no matter what part of their DNA they express more than this kid expresses something totally different and it's built in hardwired inside them that we create an environment where we can nurture that and make the adjustments necessary so like yeah I have you know my kids are so different now I have a lot of tools that I can use on all of them and some of them work differently than others. Like you're saying with your guy, like, oh, sometimes he needs a spanking. Like, I'm also not opposed to spanking. Like, some people are. In some countries, it's illegal. So I got to help families in those countries. Like, you can't ever pull out spanking or you might get fined or go to jail. So, like, you know, how do we, how do we 
nurture their nature when when I really feel like a spanking would help, but I can't use it. Like, okay, you can't use it. So we have a lot of tools, and sometimes it's ha- I have to use the same tool differently with one kid than I would with another because this kid's more sensitive to the the tone of voice that I use, and this kid's more like, you know, for like Kingston, like, hey, buddy, you owe me a spanking. Like, maybe you can say that to him, and then you have a girl, and you're, you go, hey, girl, I'm going to give you, and she melts down, not because of the spanking, but because of the tone of voice you used when you said it, right? So you're going to use the same tool, yeah. but different approaches and how you use it because of who they are. And I mean, I think the topic is so massive. It's like, yeah, we want to, I think part of the emphasis with that verse you quoted is train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it, right? So train I think Christians a lot of times get stuck training up children in all the ways they're not supposed to go. And unfortunately, that verse doesn't say that. So there is not a promise on the end. And But we get stuck in there. Train them in all the things they're not supposed to do. They're not supposed to go the ways they shouldn't go. And we expect to have them, when they're old, they won't depart from it. But he's like, no, what are we, who are they? What's the way they should go? Do you know your kid? Do you know what they're here for? Have you talked to me about them? You know, in the Bible, God's really big about going, you're going to have a kid. Here's what you're going to name him. Here's what he's going to do. Here's what, you know, Samson, like, don't eat grapes. Don't drink wine. Don't cut his hair. Boom. Now you have clear instructions on what to do with this specific kid based on who he is and what he's here for. And so I think some of that is like, I need to know who you are the way you should go, and I need to train you in that. And I need to have a lot of yeses, not just a bunch of noes. Noes are important. Noes matter. you got to have noes if you're going to have a yes. You've got to have a lot of noes to support one yes. But if I know your yes, I can aim you that direction, the way you should go, not get trapped in all the ways you shouldn't go. And so I think that can be really, really helpful to know, like, with partner with God and go, who is this kid? Mm. Who is this? Because this one's different than that one. Who's that one? Okay, who's the next one? How do I do this, Lord? Like, how do I? And then I have tools and resources available to go, oh, I need to adjust this behavior because that's not the way you should go. So I'm going to adjust this behavior. And then with you, I'm going to adjust that behavior because it's not the way you should go either. I'm going to get you back into, and that moves into like discipline is more concerned about where you're going, not about where you were. Punishment is, I want you to pay for what you did. Discipline is like, I want to help you get back to where you're going. Yeah. I'm thinking more future. And so that those tools now become discipline to go, let's move back towards who you are and what you're here for. But that story, you know, the story in the Bible is Judges 11, the Jephthah yeah. story. And, and real quick, like for the people that are watching as well, like he has books and courses that go through these practical tools that I highly recommend. Where's a, where's a place that they could see books and tools? Sethdahl.com. Seth Dahl, my D-A-H-L yeah. dot com. And, and, and so even with the, the framework that you had talked about with, you have these tools and you can pull them out in the context. So like you have some things like um, uh, options. Oh, you had given me one when Kings was little. It's like, hey, do you want to be happy or do we want to go up into our room? Yeah. And like those are because that's all I can really have. Yeah. You have things like hassle timers, which are really really cool. Yeah. Um, and 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 then let's say spanking. People can think whatever they want about spanking, but it's like for me, like I don't want to spank kinks. And you have these contexts, like what's the repercussion in the real world yeah. for the action? So spanking yeah. would be like he hits a kid in the face. Yeah. You know, or hey, or he's, he's or he throws a, a a golf club when there's a baby around. Yeah. And it's like, hey, bud, like yeah. this is. That the actual repercussion of that is you really, really hurt someone. Yeah. Um, and and so you have these, hey, I have the tools. Now with the context of who my kid is, where they're going, what their destiny is, how they're emotionally, how hard are they on themselves compared to yeah. how not. Like Kingston, it, you can say, you could be as harsh as you want and he'll laugh and at he's you. he's fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, maybe every once in a while you'll yeah. get him on like a certain day. For the most part, you're not going to be like, Kingston, no. You know, if, and again, that's him putting his hand in the fire. Yeah. Kingston, no. Yeah. He's not going to be like that freaked out about it. Yeah. Usually. Not like my friend's daughter, if they even pull out right. like the word no. And I've noticed he's sensitive to no. Yeah. So I try to like 
not really use stop and no because it's mm -hmm. like a don't tell me no, don't tell me no type thing. Yeah. And I've had to like navigate that. But based on the tools that you've provided in your books and your trainings, yeah. I can kind of whip them out, kind of like a job. You yeah. know, it's like every once in a while there's going to be a nail and there's yeah. going to be, you, know, you the use the opposite side of the hammer to pull out the nail yeah. and, and different tools. So I wanted to address that beforehand. Yeah, like, so spanking is a good one, like to help understand this. I... You know, if the kid is climbing on the roof, I want to make sure you understand that that choice causes physical pain. If you fall off the roof, you are going to hurt. So in, in my world, I'm going, that's a great place for a spanking because I'm actually creating a connection in your mind that this type of choice has physical pain as a consequence. So I'm not spanking you just to get you to stop. I'm spanking you to get that connection in your head to go, Every choice has a consequence. If I make good choices, I have good consequences. If I make bad choices, I have bad consequences. And that's where discipline comes in. Like I'm disciplining you to make connections in your head to understand what I do has an effect. And so if you're climbing on the roof, if you're throwing golf clubs at babies, like that's a great place to go, this causes physical pain. These kind of choices cause physical pain. Now, a lot of parents spank for everything I was like, well, most of what the kid is doing doesn't, in the real world, in, in grown-up life, physical pain is not the actual consequence for that type of choice. So I need to introduce different tools to create different connections. That's my job. How do I create connections in your head to know what type of choices have certain types of consequences? So hassle time is a great example. Like, if you're not coming in the house and brushing your teeth and getting ready for bed when it's time to go to bed, I don't want to spank you because in re in the real world, you know, no one's going to come and hit you for being late to work yeah. or late to your company or whatever it is. Late to school, no one's going to hit you. You're going to have a different type of consequence. So hassle mm -hmm. time is like, hey, all right, you don't want to come in and brush your teeth and get ready for bed? No problem. Hassle time's on. Take as much time as you need. Right. So I'm giving you power to make your own dec decisions. I'm not trying to control you to quickly throw that in there. You know, God's not interested in control. Otherwise, a fruit of the Spirit wouldn't be self-control. Right? He's trying to grow self-control in our lives. Even when we give our lives to Him and we're like, take me over, take over my life. He's like, all right, here you go. Now I freed you from all the things that controlled you. Now you get to control you again. And I will work with you and partner with you and, and help you but ultimately you still get to control you. And so in the context of kids, like, oh, I don't want to control you or I might violate what God is trying to grow in your life. And so hassle time is like, hey, you don't have to come in. It's bedtime. You don't have to come in. Hassle time's on. Take as much time as you need. There is a consequence. I've just told you there will be a consequence, hassle time. But you have the freedom to decide what you're going to do. Are you going to come in and brush your teeth? The consequence changes based on how long you're out there. If you stay out 20 minutes, the consequence changes based on how long you stay out there. So you decide the consequence you want. So hassle time is I'll let you go and do what you want to do and I don't want you to do, but you, I'll, I'll keep track of the time, right? So you don't come in for 20 minutes, no sweat. All right, cool, let's brush teeth. Let's get your pajamas on. Let's get you in bed. You got 20 minutes. You can't use hassle time at three years old. He needs to be at least five, probably. But Because right now he doesn't care about the future of something being no, gone. It has to connect right now. That choice has yeah. a consequence right now. Like legitimately, tomorrow. I'm like trying and it's like, yeah. hey, bud, we're going to take away your toys. And he goes, okay, yeah, <laughs> take away all my toys. Yeah. Like, I don't know what that means right now. Yeah. And then later it's just it's with, a bigger yeah, problem. With your age, they need to have the consequence happen immediately so they connect it to that choice. Hassle time yeah. is five and over. You can use it and go... Hey, you didn't brush your teeth. You took 20 minutes. No sweat. You owe me 20 minutes. Then tomorrow, when it's time to watch a show, hey, you owe me 20 minutes of hassle time. Or in my favorite story is when we were going to Legoland and this happened. And my kid had 17 minutes of hassle time at Legoland. And so literally, he's sitting in Legoland watching all the children come in and he's paying back his time. I let him pay back seven minutes at the pool the night before, which was torture to him because he's watching everyone else swim and he's got seven minutes here. The next day he's got 10 minutes still 
at Legoland. All the children are coming in. He's watching them. He can hear them. The rides are going, and he's sitting there waiting for 10 minutes. Feels like an eternity. But I'm going, hey, you got hassle time. You got to pay me back. Like, you, you did that thing for 17 minutes, and now you have to give me back that time. And so, you know, it's it's that tool is so powerful because yeah. then for six months, if he heard the word hassle start to come out of my mouth, boom, he's in doing brushing his teeth, getting ready for bed, whatever it is. Like he does not want to pay back hassle time. And so he's realizing I'm in control of me, but there are consequences for my choices. Mm-hmm. If I make that decision, there will be a consequence. It's real life. I'm not spanking you because you didn't come brush your teeth. I'm letting you rack up time. And you can pay me back when it's a hassle for you. It was a hassle for me when you didn't brush your teeth. Now it's a hassle for you when you're trying to go to Legoland. And so it's a real life consequence to, con- to build the connections, not showing up on time, not doing the thing I need to do does have a consequence. You know, now it's like, hey, if Nicholas doesn't show up yeah. for the company, there's a consequence. Yep. There's a, there is a consequence for you. But it has nothing to do with somebody hurting you or physical pain. It's like, yeah. oh, it's financial pain if I don't show up. So I teach myself to show up so that I get the consequence I do want, not the consequence I don't want. Yeah. That happens in childhood. And, you know, uh, it, it can happen in childhood where kids learn to make those connections when they're small. Like in your age, I call it the reset chair now. Usually it's like, hey you're doing something, whatever it is. You're yelling at your brother. You're yelling at, he doesn't have a brother yet yeah. to yell at. But like, no, you guys are fighting. Cool. Hey, grab a seat in the reset chair. They go get a seat. Guys, as soon as you're ready to talk like this, come on out. As soon as you're ready to not punch each other, come on out. As soon as you're ready to eat dinner, come on out. So instead of like, hey, it's dinner time and you don't want to come in. Oh, I'm not going to let you just rack it up and make you pay it back later, I'm going to have you sit down and go, hey, if you're not going to eat dinner, cool. But you don't get to just freely play as much as you want while we eat dinner. You get to sit here. So I limit freedom and boundaries. I limit, I give you boundaries around where you can go. I take away a little bit of your freedom until you make the choice to come eat dinner. And then as soon as you do, all your freedom is returned. Or you're fighting, I'm going to limit your freedom I'm going to give you boundaries, put a boundary around you, sit in the chair. When you're ready to not do that anymore or you're ready to talk like this, come on out. So there's boundaries that removes freedom, but you get to decide when you get your freedom back. Okay, I'm not going to talk like that. Cool, come on out. Okay, I'm not going to fight. Cool, come on out. Okay, I'm going to eat dinner. Cool, come on out. So you have freedom and boundaries at the same time, and the kid is empowered to make the call of when they get to come out. And when they get their full freedom back. Yeah. You, you've been a kid. You've been in youth ministry and, and children's. I was youth is older in church, but, you know, small people. Yeah. You've been working in this a long time. Obviously, even had this encounter where it felt like God was like, hey, this is an area that you're going to cover. Yeah. You've worked with families. You've worked with kids. You, you've seen a lot of things. So you've had more reps than maybe even a parent would. Yeah. You're also a parent. Yeah. Right? You have a kid that's about to turn 13 and then, mm-hmm. and then lower down and boys and girls and all these things. One of the biggest things that you said was that everything's on the basis of connection. So everything we're talking about right now is like, hey, your kid's doing something that they probably shouldn't. Yeah. Hey, we want to train them to do the things that they should. So this is the way to set up that dynamic. Mm-hmm. But then there can be this like no emotional connection. And so yeah. what's, what's the way that you found to establish that in a deeper way? Because it, it, sometimes it can feel like that's all you're doing all day, yeah. like, especially with a kid who's very yeah. like, you know, when my son's outside playing in the sand, he like doesn't want to do anything else, yeah. hardly can do anything else because he covers himself in sand and then it's like, now it's time for a bath. Like yeah. we can't even come back the in the house and eat have, dinner. Yeah. So, and and I, lo- I love him doing this stuff. Like I'm like... Play all, yeah. Yeah, because I'd rather not just micromanage him. I'm just like, whatever. You want to get fully sandy, yeah. then whatever at least it's fun and and there's not a real big purpose to stop but when i'm putting myself in the shoes i'm like all right these are the tools but i would assume that my big thought is what is the things that you've learned over this year and what are the core things that you've seen in families and i would say probably actually establishing a connection with your kids yeah is probably what's missing more so and harder to implement than the 
than the tactic of, oh yeah, great, I'll put on a timer when my kids yeah. aren't listening to me. Like that sounds yeah. cool. But connection is a whole different thing. How can we establish that better? Yeah. And even using the tools and disciplining our kids, the mindset needs to be, I'm doing this in a way to protect our connection. Because I can pull out the hassle timer and be sarcastic and be rude. Disconnected. And, and all I do is damage our relationship. I may get you to behave properly and I may have used the tool, but the way I used it destroyed the very thing that actually makes it work well. And so eventually it's not good. What you want to have, the mindset is, yeah, we're, I'll talk about building connection, strengthening connection, but at the same time, even discipline, my heart needs to be when I discipline you, when I correct you, when I, when I adjust you, when I allow you to have a consequence, my heart is to protect our connection the whole time. So, Because mm. I can use all those tools and punish and control and force you to do things, and little by little, I am just ruining us but I got the right behavior. So yeah, connection is huge. This stuff works, everything works well, better with connection. And what would connection. you say it is? Like, is it the tone of voice, the intention? Cause I catch myself all the time. There's times where we're in a, you know, I'm in the airport, we're in customs. Yeah. Uh, it's five in the morning, we land in New York City and my son is in his pajamas riding on a, and we're standing in line to try to get through the yeah. line at customs and he yeah. wants to just run. Yeah. And I'm like, this is really run. difficult to establish. Yeah. And I'm very tired. Connection. And I'm. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, I'm. I'm I literally feel like this kid's been put in my life to literally drive me nuts. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. You know, in those instances where it's like, hey, bud, like, I really. I. We don't run around because of this, and I don't want to sit you in your stroller. I'd like yeah. for you to be able to stand by me, but we're strapping you in your stroller because, like, yeah. how do I. So How do I do it? Here's, here's in those, it's, yeah. it may be easier on my own time at home yeah. when I'm like, okay, if he doesn't listen to me for 20 minutes, it doesn't like get the security guards to take me out right. from the Yeah, customs. or we're in customs and this could be really bad. If, yep. Yeah, um, yeah. in that, that's great. Like when we're tired, we got to be self-aware enough to realize that. And when you're in an airport and you're in customs, like there's no room for us to mess around here. There is no room. Yeah. And so... How do I protect, protect the connection that we do have and even strengthen it in these moments? I think one of the things we want to be aware of with kids, I call it the sixth love language. There's five love languages. I, yeah. the, the sixth one, I think, is fun and enjoyment, like enjoying each other. So like in those contexts, I go, can I make this fun for you to stay here? Mm -hmm. So instead of me going, no, we can't go there. No, they're security guards. No, they're watching everything we're doing. The cameras are on us. They're, they're paying attention. No, you can't just leave and run around the airport all by yourself when we're in New York and none of us are s caught up on sleep. You, know, you can't explain any of that to a three-year-old in the middle of it. What you want to do is go, how can I make the stroller really enjoyable? Or how can I and have fun yeah. later? How can I mess around with you so you want to stay here and we're going back and forth or whatever? Like, we're going to have fun. Come here, over here. All right, try to give a high five. Try to, whoop, missed it, missed it, right? So you can play. I, I, I think in those contexts, how do I crank the fun way up, right? Because what am I doing? I'm building a strong connection with this three-year-old in a crazy environment that, that we have to abide by the rules. We all do. And so how do I actually make this so fun so that we get out and we're like, dude, that was awesome. That was so much fun. That was yeah. so great. So like for me in airports with the little ones, I would always, like Lauren would just laugh at me and she loved it because I'd be like, all right, it's time to play keep up with daddy game. Let's see who can keep up with me. And I'd be like walking down the thing and then I'd jump on the on the little moving sidewalk and they have to like quickly get over and move. I'm like, oh, if you can't keep up with daddy, this old man is going to beat you and you're not. Uh, so I would just make it fun. So I'm like, yeah. oh, we got to get through the airport. We got to move to our gate. We got to hurry up. We're, we're, we got, we're managing all this stuff with these kids. And so I'm going, if I can make this fun, we get That's out cool. on the other side and we're like, wow, our connection is better because we played a game or we had fun or we enjoyed each other throughout the airport rather than me just going, oh my gosh, this is a nightmare. I can't believe this. I'm so mad. I'm so frustrated. And I'm scared to get in trouble because customs are here. Like I, I, you know, you're managing all that stuff. But if I can crank the fun up in those contexts, I can come out with a stronger connection. So like, you know, my daughter's a great example right now. 
She's heading almost 13, so she now has periods, which means she has PMS, which means I need to keep that in mind and go, all right, that reaction, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to understand, I think you're on that time of the month, and I'm going to be aware of that. And so I'm going to dial down anything that could throw you for a loop because your emotions are turned way up. I'm going to turn mine way down in this for a week. I'm turning them down, and I'm going to go into this being aware that I could, I, I could step on a landmine at any time. So I'm, I'm going to intentionally do that. I also look for, like with her right now, she's like, Daddy, come read with me. So the boys will be in bed. I'll go in there. And we literally, last night, we sat there over 20 minutes eating Caesar salad. She loves Caesar salad. So we're like, it's 10 o'clock at night, eating Caesar salad, reading books, graphic novel books that she loves. And she just wants me with her. So I'm going to go, let me sit here and read a book with you and eat salad and then we're going to make another one and we're going to eat more salad and we're just going to sit here and read like i'm building connection i'm strengthening connection with her now my six-year-old it's like just pick the kid up and slam him on the bed and wrestle him one two and let him kick me into the wall and then come back and give him some more you know like so (laughs) so how i build connection yeah it's sort of your life right now so how i build connection with them is different how i strengthen it's different but i got to go I got to look at with my daughter like, ooh, I got to be careful here because I can damage connection real easy. But I'm also looking for what are you asking for? What are you what are you looking for? Oh, you just want me to read a book and sit in your room. We're not even reading the same book. You're reading one. I'm reading one. I'm like, hey, did you see this? This is hilarious. Yeah. You know, it's 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 these funny little books. And she's like, Dad, check this out. So just being there with her in reading books, that's. For her, it's a quality time. It's a love language, quality time. And so that's that. I think with my son, it's physical touch, quality time, slamming him on the bed, wrestling him, you know, all that. So, but that's, you know, love languages are a great way to connect. Understanding, yeah, if you got a kid that's on their period, okay, I I need to protect this even harder than I normally do because this is a wild ride. But I'm looking for those kinds of things to connect with them. So it's not just I'm correcting behaviors all the time, adjusting behaviors. That stuff's important. But I'm also going, when I do that, I want to do it from connection. You know, like if we're really connected, if we're like locked arms, when I turn, you turn. If we're not connected at all and we're like, bro, hey, come over here, come over here, come over here. I'm trying to convince you to come with me. But if we're connected, you you come but automatically. Yeah. And so that's kind of the picture. I want to be locked in with them in our hearts. So when we need to make those adjustments, it's a lot easier for them to come along. So good, first off. Some of the things that come up for me is, I'm trying to think of, there's got to be a core thing that you see people doing wrong. Like you're seeing families and kids and dynamics like that. Just because we're wrapping up, I'm like, oh man, I have so many more things I want to ask. And same thing. I, know, I feel I'm like, like we like, just oh keep going. Uh, one of the things I'm thinking of is like, what's a biblical thing that maybe the world does so different that's like very simple? So like, let's say for business, a lot of times it's transactional buying and selling. Kingdom is sowing and reaping. Very yeah. good distinction. You can tell the difference and you can talk about it. And that, yeah. that's like a big epiphany. And the way that people parent and connect with their kids What's something that the world does that maybe biblically is like, hey, this is actually like a good frame of reference to look at it. And I, I, one of them I, they, I know you teach, I thought would be good. And if there's something wrapped in it, with all the families you see, what is like a core thing that you see people just constantly messing up that, man, if they just knew that earlier, yeah, <laughs> that way we don't leave people without that, yeah. that core thing. I think... A lot of times it's kind of what we're talking about, trying to put a cart before the horse, trying to correct a behavior without the relationship. And so there's some times where I've literally just told parents like, hey, you're looking, you're looking for tools, but the way you're using them is still to try to control your kid. I mean, I think actually that's what it goes into. What do I believe? What's my beliefs? If I'm looking to just get my kid to obey, 
which in the in the kingdom in the in in the in the Bible, like obedience matters. Obedience is important. But God actually in the garden allowed his kids to disobey and then face the consequence. He didn't yeah. remove the bad choice. He left it right there. He didn't remove the serpent. He left him right there. He allowed them to make the choice he didn't want them to make. And I think the biggest thing I see with parents, and it comes from you're trying to control behavior without the relationship, I think that that's where it comes from is this belief that I'm supposed to control my kids or if I'm a good parent, I need to take away bad choices, make their good choices for them. I need to... Uh, control everything in their environment so that they turn into the person I know they can be rather than going, oh, I, it's not my job to control. It's my job to influence. That's what you see in the garden. God going, don't eat that tree. It'll kill you. And then he leaves the tree and he leaves the snake. So he, he's influencing them and not, not forcing them to do the thing he wants them to do. He's, he's influencing their decision, and then he lets them have the consequence. But I think it backs up all the way to, that's not my job. My job is not control. My job is influence. So I need to influence based on relationship, not just getting advice. Christians are really good at going, give me advice. Tell me what to do. I'll, I want my kids to obey. I want my kids to listen to me. Just tell me what to do so I get my kids to listen. You know, your kids will listen if you back off, listen a lot better if you back off and, and don't control them and give them some space and then have the consequences. But it starts with that mindset, that belief of my job is influence, not control. And part of that got sparked, and I'll, I'll have you wrap up with this story that, that you were talking about, the biblical story that, that we had, I had rudely interrupted. But we'll, we'll end with that. I think it's a great frame for everyone leaving here to have a... a a frame of reference, but also an anchor of thought of what's my intention leaving here. So bring us through that story. Yeah, so Judges 11, you have Jephthah is this guy. His dad sleeps with a prostitute, and so he is the child of a prostitute. And he has a, nut, a bunch of brothers that are not the children of a prostitute. So they basically kick him off the land, kick him out. Don't let him have any land as an inheritance. Just remove this guy from the family and the land. And so this dude is just not well. He's a great warrior, super powerful warrior. Over time, the Ammonites come in. These, this enemy that is just mad from the past and wants to take over Israel. So they're coming to war with Israel. And now the very brothers that kicked out Jephthah are coming to him going, Hey, if you come in and help us and you win, if you get the victory, we will make you ruler over us. Like there wasn't kings back then. There was judges. So there's no kings yet. But basically the ruler of Israel is the judge of Israel. And they're saying, if you win this victory and save Israel from this enemy, we will make you ruler. And he's like, you will? If I win, you're going to make me ruler to the very people who kicked him out? And he, they're like, yes. And he goes, okay. So then he goes to God and goes, God, I will offer you the first thing. If I win, the first thing that comes out of my house, stupid. What a stupid thing to say. Like, what's going to come out? A goat? No, probably not. He says, whatever comes out of my house first, I'll offer to you. I'll give to you. I'll sacrifice it if you give me the victory. So he goes to war, gets the, I mean, the story is longer than this, but he gets the victory. They win. He's coming home, and out pops his daughter, his only kid. She comes out the door. She's dancing. She's, like, celebrating his victory. And he just breaks down and is like, I have to sacrifice my daughter because I got the victory. And so he ends up, she goes off for a while to mourn that she'll never have children, and then he sacrifices her. And so the story is like, we don't want to sacrifice our kids for success. We don't want to... We don't want to sacrifice our families on the altar of, and that's why I, I love this. Like, you're, you're doing both. You know, I think it's Proverbs 10, I think it's 22, says the blessing of God makes one rich and adds no sorrow to it. All right, so like we want to, we want to succeed in business and have our family succeed, not yeah. sacrifice them on that altar. And, but I have to ask myself, myself looking at that, like how did this guy get there? Oh, he was hurt by his family. 
Yep. He was hurt. He had family wounds. He had family issues. And so all, all of his, he ends up wounding, not, not just wounding, completely destroying his family because his childhood wounds weren't healed. He's coming into this thing, a wounded boy that's now a powerful man that wants success in the, fa- in the eyes of his brothers, in the eyes of his family. The very people that hurt him, he wants success there, and he's willing to destroy her to get it. And they're like, oh, your wounds got much worse because you didn't get them healed. And I think that, you know, that whole control thing, that whole belief system around control and, and just wanting obedience, not, not, not influence, not cooperation. We just want obedience. and I'm going to control you to get it. Like that stuff comes from how we were raised, how we were brought up, or it's a reaction to how we were brought up. And so we have that thing. I think, I think it comes down to if I want to have the right beliefs, I probably also need to get healed from my stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, that's what we, I focus a lot on that kind of thing. Like I actually want to bring healing and restoration to your theology about God, what you believe about God, because what you believe about God right now, I will take a fast rabbit trail. Like with kids, here's what I've seen. I've seen it for 21 years now. Kids believe their parents as theology no matter what Sunday school teaches them. So Sunday school can teach you, Father God is loving, Father God is kind, Father God is patient, Father God loves you. And then they go home and the dad dad doesn't. That kid will struggle to believe God is who God is because of dad, because of mom, because of their family situation. So fast rabbit trail, we become the theology our kids believe no matter what Sunday school teaches them. The areas of our lives where we are not displaying God's nature are areas that are going to struggle with God. The areas that I'm wounded in theologically with God will be the areas I play out in my kids. So if I think God's a controller because my parents were controlling, I'll either react and never do that or I will become that thing and I will control you. But it comes back to my beliefs are shaped by by my family no matter what Sunday school tells me. You know how many people I've, I've worked with 50-year-olds. They're like, I've never felt God's love. Now, these are people who've been saved their whole life. They can quote all the scriptures about God's love. They could preach sermons on God's love. They don't feel it because dad only gave love when they performed. Mm. So their performance takes all the love and their person never gets it. And now this parent is struggling with her own kids but it comes back. So I, I feel like I'm kind of talking in circles, but that belief, that belief is not my job to control. It's my job to influence. Oftentimes has its roots in, am I healed or not? Am I whole or not? I'm living out based on my health or based on my healing or my wound. And, and I've got to, I've got to get some of that sorted. I've got to take my parents' faces off God so I can see him clearly because when I see him, I become like him. And now I begin to change how I parent, how I live because I'm seeing God differently because I'm getting those wounds healed. Well, dude, it's been so, I mean, many applause. Other people, you give them applause even where you're at. Uh, First off, it's been so cool having you come into King's Brotherhood and what we've done and speaking to our guys. I've had guys break down going, I'll never parent the same. I've had guys that go, whoops. I've had guys go, man, this confirms some of the things that I am doing. I need to do that more because I know your stuff and I still am like, well, let's talk about it here again because I'm running into new problems and they get different ages. You you will keep hitting them. Yeah, I'll keep hitting them. And so for the people that want to get more connected, you talked about Mm sethdahl.com, S-E-T-H-D-A-H-L.com, courses, books, et cetera. Uh, Where can they follow you on social? Yep, Seth Dahl. Seth Dahl. So yep. very simple, Instagram.com slash Seth Dahl. So you guys are wanna go, gonna wanna go get connected to his stuff. Again, it's just, this is an area that's very important. You'll hear it throughout all the episodes and, and I believe he's one of the best in the world at this. I just loved bringing you on, so thank, thank you. you. And again, thank you for listening to God's Business. You made it at this point. It means you really like the episode. And so what you're gonna wanna do is go and hit that subscribe button. If you're on iTunes, it'd be awesome if you left a rate and review. 
make it honest, bro. Some guys are like, oh, I'll give you a one star. I'm like, bro, give me it. Give me the one star. Yeah. If you're if it was valuable to you, give it that five star. We'd love to read that. It's encouraging to all of us. As well as if you're on YouTube, you can actually ring this little bell, watch the video version. You can see our emotions and all the dynamics to it. You can ring the bell to get uh, notified when we drop new episodes, as well as subscribe so that we're right there and easy to check it out. Thank you for watching God's Business and thank you, Seth, for being with us. Thanks for having me.